I'd like you to take your Bible, if you have one there or a device, and turn to the Gospel of Luke and chapter number 10. We're going to look at a parable of the Lord Jesus Christ that he told, and one that I believe illustrates some wonderful truth for us today. In Luke chapter 10, look with me at verse number 30. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. When I read this passage of Scripture here in the Gospel of Luke, I realize that social distancing is not a new concept or a new practice. We see it right here in the Word of God. I suppose that term of social distancing is becoming something that we are very familiar with these days. We think a lot about our activities and where we are with respect to other people, whether we go out for some exercise or whether we go to the store for some of those essentials. We're very careful to make sure that there's some distance between us and other people in order to protect ourselves or to protect them. But you know, social distancing must not prohibit us from a very important spiritual discipline. Things are no doubt going to change in our lives as a result of this pandemic. No doubt there will be some policies when we go to places after this is all over and we get back to some kind of normalcy, it won't be really normal. There will be some changes perhaps in the way that we go about our work or how we worship in church. I don't know how that will all turn out. But we dare not forget God has told us man's greatest need. While we're going to be careful around people when it comes to the physical proximity of our lives with them, God has informed us in his word that man has a great spiritual need and we must not neglect that in our lives and ministry. I wonder, are we practicing spiritual distancing when it comes to people? Are we involved in distancing ourselves from those who have a great need today? Let's look at these three individuals in this parable that the Lord gives us and see if we can discover some truth that will help us when it comes to spiritual distancing. First, we find some individuals in this passage who beat up. We see in verse number 30, Jesus said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. What a picture this is of what sin and the world and the devil does to people. People go through life and they live perhaps for the pleasures of this world. They live for the material things of life. They, they involve all of their energy and their time into that which can satisfy them in some way physically or emotionally. But when it's all over, they are left beat up. The devil loves to beat up people. He loves to destroy their lives. We see that this man is left abused. He's robbed. He has been, he has been beaten up. He, he's been injured and left alongside the road. Jesus described the work of Satan in, in John chapter 10 and verse 10 when he said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. 
What a picture this parable is of, of the devil's work in the world today. He seeks to destroy. He seeks to ruin. He, he seeks to abuse the lives of people. At the end of the devil's work, people are left with emptiness. They're, they're left with void. They're left with misery. In Haggai chapter 1, God addresses this problem in man today as man goes through life and he seeks all these things that can satisfy. He works hard. He, he plays hard. He, 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 he does the things that he thinks are going to satisfy and complete him in some way. But, but God says there in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 5, now therefore consider your ways. You sow much, but you bring in little. You eat, but there's none full. You drink, but there's none filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. Oh, the devil entices us with the material things. He says, hey, this will make you happy. This will satisfy you. And he entices us with sins, those lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And he says, hey, come over here. This will make you happy. This will satisfy you. But you know, when it's all over, he leaves us abused. Not only was this man left abused, he was left abandoned. The Bible says here in verse number 30 that he departed, leaving him half dead. When sin is finished, when sin's work is done, when, when it abuses, when it robs, when it injures, it just leaves and leaves us by the side of the road of life half dead. Satan will uh, care about you for a while, but when it's all over, he takes your wealth he takes your health and abandons you. I'm so glad that our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, gives us a whole different picture about himself. You see, when the Lord Jesus Christ saves us, when he comes into our life, when we come to him and ask him to be our Savior, he doesn't leave us in a moment of trouble. He doesn't leave us in a time of difficulty. He doesn't abandon us in that hour of great need. No, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 tells us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Paul put it so well in the book of Romans in chapter 8 when he says, who shall, who, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or a nakedness? or peril, or sword. In verse 38, he says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Thank God when you trust him as your savior, when you come to Christ and let him take your life, he promises never to abuse, never to abandon he is your savior. He is your caregiver. He is your all and in all forever. We see those who beat up. But then we see a second group of people. We see those who pass up. In verse number 31, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. They were alerted to the need. They, they saw the need here. They saw this man robbed. They saw this man abused. They saw this man abandoned by the side of the road. It wasn't that they missed seeing it. They were alerted to the need. I wonder, do we see the need in people's lives today. Oh, sure, we look out at our world today and we see many needs. We see the needs of those who are afflicted with this virus. We see the needs of those who have a need of comfort in a time of, of loss. We see the needs of people physically and emotionally, but I wonder, do we see the spiritual needs of people today? Are we alerted to that need? 
Or are we so focused on ourselves, our, our eyes inward, so that we cannot lift up our eyes and look on the fields and, and see those with a spiritual need? Are we so focused on our problems? Are we so focused on our lack? Are we so focused on our discomfort in this time that we live in today that we cannot see the need of those around us spiritually? Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, all seek their own and not the things of Jesus Christ. How easy it is in a time that we're going through right now to just look at our own problems, to look at our own uh, inefficiency, to look at our own lack. and We get our eyes on ourselves, and we forget there's a world with a great spiritual need. Paul reminds us in Philippians 2 and verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Paul tells us in Romans 15, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. In Galatians chapter 6, we're to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In James chapter 1, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the, and the, and the widows in their affliction. Oh, how we need to get our eyes in this moment off of ourselves and see once again the spiritual need of those all around us. They were alerted to the need. They acknowledged the need. In verse 32, it says of the Levite, he not only saw, but the Bible says he, he looked on him. That would indicate to me that he, he paused for a moment. He stopped in his tracks. He saw this man abused and abandoned. He saw this man in, in great injury and loss. And he looked. He took a moment to observe. Do we really acknowledge today that all of the disease and all of the distress and all of the division of this life are just a result of man's greatest need, that need of a savior. So often we see the fruit of a calamity, but we don't stop and think about the root of that calamity. We, we see the results of a pandemic. We see the loss of life. We, we see the hospitals. We, we see the, the caregivers. We see the immediate fruit of the problem. But do we understand the root? Men need Christ. Oh, death is a horrible thing. But there's something even more horrific than death. And that's to die without a Savior. Every day I look at the news and I, I don't know how it's pictured perhaps on the things that you look at, but one of the apps that I look at, it shows in Los Angeles County the number of people with the uh, coronavirus and it's pictured with a red bar. And it shows that, that number by a visual there of a bar that's in red. And at the top of that red bar, there's a, there's a black square that indicates the number of deaths. It's, hard, it's disheartening every day to, to look at those numbers uh, inching upward of those with sickness and, and those who are dying of that sickness. But I've thought to myself, there really needs in my mind's eye at least to be another bar. There needs to be another square somewhere, another visual to help me to see how many of those people that are dying, how many of that black box are dying without Christ. For that is a far more horrific statistic than those who merely die. You see, for the child of God, someone who has Christ as Savior to die is gain. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. But for those who die without Christ, it is hopeless. They are hopelessly lost forever. Somehow we must pause and acknowledge that need, that spiritual need. He that hath the Son hath life, but he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. They were alerted to the need. They acknowledged the need, but notice they avoided that need. The Bible says of both of these men, the priest and the Levite, they passed by on the other side. 
They practiced spiritual distancing. They, they saw the individual. They saw the abused, the abandoned alongside the road. They, they acknowledged the need. They saw the need was great. But they practiced spiritual distancing. I looked on my right hand, the psalmist said. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I watched these healthcare workers go so bravely into those hospitals and treat these people, risking their own lives, risking their own well-being to assist others with a physical need. Caring. They go because they care. They go because they have the ability to help physically someone in great need. And, and they go, they, they risk their life, they risk their family's health to care. And yet so often as Christians, we are unwilling to care about the greater need. In Jeremiah chapter 8, God paints a picture of the nation of Israel, a nation that was backslidden, a nation that was away from God, a nation that had lost their blush. They couldn't even blush at their sin anymore, a nation that had rejected God's word and, and had lived in their own selfish interest. But God comes to that last verse in Jeremiah 8. And in verse 22, he says, Is there not a, no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of my people recovered? God sees the problem. He sees the need spiritually. And, and, and he says, but wait a minute. Isn't there a, a medicine? Isn't there a vaccine for this spiritual dilemma? Isn't there a caregiver that will go? Oh, why aren't my people recovering from this spiritual death? Why aren't they recovering from this spiritual disease? Where are the doctors? Where are the physicians? Where is the medicine? I've given it to you. We have it. And yet so often we are among those who pass up. We see. We observe. But we do nothing about it. God, like he was in the book of Ezekiel, is still, is still seeking for a man that will stand in the gap and make up the hedge that he might not destroy the land. May he find us not beating up, not passing up. But the third group of people we see in this parable are those who were helping up. We come to verse number 33, and the Bible says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now, this Samaritan is an unlikely source. The religious crowd that's already passed by, they were the more likely source to help. After all, they were in the ministry the last time I checked the word ministry, it has to do with ministering. It has to do with serving the priest, the Levite. They should have been the ones to, to help this man. The Samaritan was an outcast. He was looked down upon. A Samaritan was considered the lowliest of, of people in this particular time. And yet he becomes the source of help. Do you realize that you don't have to have credentials to care? You don't have to be in the ministry to minister. Compassion should be the heart, part of every one of us. It should be in our heart to have compassion on those with need. By the way, I think that's something that God gives us naturally, a natural compassion. And I believe that from the Bible. I think back to the story of little Moses as a baby. He was placed into a, a basket and put out in the river, you recall, there in Exodus chapter 20. And the Bible says in verse 6 that Pharaoh's daughter. Now here was a woman that was raised in Egypt. Here was a woman that had no understanding of the true God. She had no understanding of truth. She was raised with a silver spoon in her mouth, so to speak, in the king's palace. She had all the luxuries of life, but she had no spirituality to her. But the Bible says in verse 6 that when she opened that basket, it says the babe 
wept and she had compassion on him. That tells me that God has placed compassion in the heart of every person. Uh, I think of the barbarous people in Acts chapter 28. Paul, you recall, uh, gets caught in this horrible storm as a prisoner on board a boat. And, and this, this ship is wrecked to pieces and they, they end up on this island of barbarous people. And it says in verse 2, the barbarous people, Paul says, showed us no little kindness for they kindled the fire and received us every one because of the rain and because of the cold. It was a barbarous people who had compassion, who, who cared about the needs of, of these people on board this ship. How much more should a child of God have a compassion in our hearts for those who have a much greater need, a spiritual need? Here was an unlikely source, but we see an unabated sacrifice in verse 34, look what he does. He, he went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. Well, you talk about someone going the extra mile. You talk about someone that uh, spent and was spent for the cause of this man. He was a complete stranger. He did not know the fellow alongside the road that was abused and abandoned. But he goes the extra mile to do all that he can to, to bind up his wounds, to, to try to uh, care for him there in that situation, placing him on his own beast and bringing him to a place where he can get rest and, and, and provision. It reminds me of what Paul said, I'll very gladly spend and be spent for you. The unabased sacrifice it reminds us of the sacrifice of Christ himself, does it not? This past week, we've thought much about Christ and his death and burial and resurrection. And we think about Christ and his suffering for us, his sacrifice for us. And the love of Christ ought to constrain us, Paul said, because we judge that if Christ died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. An unabated sacrifice. But then I see also an unheralded service. This man helps. He does beyond the call of duty, it would seem. He goes beyond the, the minimum here to help a guy get some need met in his life. He even promises to pay for any expenses of the future. He goes way beyond what he was expected to do. And then he just goes his way. The parable ends. We never hear of this man again. Apparently, he doesn't hang around in the morning to tell the man goodbye or to receive some kind of thanks from him or applause. He no doubt never has contact with this man who was beaten up again. An unheralded service. There's no thank you. There's no reciprocation. There's no applause. You know, sometimes I'm afraid we're willing to help up as long as somebody afterwards is lifting us up. We can learn from this Samaritan here. Someone who wasn't concerned about what was in it for him. He saw only the need of this one he could help. Does it really matter who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory? Does it really matter whether we're at the forefront or behind the scenes as long as God is magnified and glorified? He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Would you help someone to Christ? William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. And Mrs. Booth, William Booth's wife, had a particular burden to prisoners, people who were incarcerated. She would often go to a prison cell or a, a jail and she would minister to people in those conditions. One day as she was making some calls and a terrible old 
broken down prison, she suddenly heard a woman's voice shouting, very shrill. She saw two policemen holding this struggling woman. Her hair was matted. There was a large bruise on one side of her forehead and a large blood clot on the other. Her garments were torn and disheveled and dirty. She looked like a miserable, wretched woman, which she was. Mrs. Booth's heart went out to that poor creature in her sin. Instead of judging her, she loved her. She loved her because her heart was filled with the love of Christ, who loves souls. She thought, what can I do? A prayer? No. Uh, could I write a check? No. What can I do? Instinctively, she reached up as the woman came by and planted a kiss on her cheek. The woman cried, who was that that just kissed me? Who just kissed me? Mrs. Booth melted back into the crowd. And the poor, wretched woman was drugged to her cell. The next day, Mrs. Booth revisited that same prison. The matron said to her, we think she's crazy. She just paces back and forth in her cell saying the same thing over and over and over again. Who kissed me? Who kissed me? Somebody please tell me who kissed me. When Mrs. Booth walked to that cell, that was the first thing the woman said to her. Oh, lady, can you please tell me who it was that kissed me yesterday? Mrs. Booth said, tell me. Why do you ask that question? With te tears rolling down her cheeks, the woman turned to her and said, my mother died when I was just seven years old. She was a gentle lady, but very poor. She died in a dark, cold basement. Just before she died, she called me to her side. She took my little head in her hands and she cried, oh, my poor little weak, defenseless girl. God, please take care of my poor little defenseless girl. Then my mother kissed me and she died. That was the last time anybody cared about me. That was the last time anybody kissed me. Nobody has cared about me or loved me all of my life. I've been kicked around and buffeted, but nobody, nobody has ever cared for me. Nobody has ever given me a kiss until yesterday. Mrs. Booth said, young lady, I was the one that planted that kiss on your cheek. I did it because I love you. I love you because Christ dwells in my heart and has filled my heart with a love for people just like you. And she took her Bible and she poured out the greatest of all love from the scriptures the love of Calvary, where God kissed the sinner's sins away with the blood of his own precious son. That poor, wretched woman knelt there in that prison cell and found peace and salvation in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because somebody loved her. Somebody helped up. Will you be that somebody? that helps someone else spiritually this week. Father, would you help us to be the third of these three? Lord, the world is filled with people who beat up others. And the world and maybe even our churches are filled with people who pass up. But Lord, may we be the ones who help up not for our glory, but for yours, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of souls eternally. Help us to be like this good Samaritan. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.